Hey, how's it going, dirty sulfurs? Today I'm gonna to show you how you can get more torque from your engine down to your wheels. And I'm gonna show you how you can do that by the way of gear ratios. And if you don't know what gear ratios are, well, you're in luck, because today I'm gonna to over explain it. So for this explanation, we'll start all the way at our engine. So as the air fuel mixture is being ignited inside our combustion chambers, it forces our pistons to go down. And in turn, those pistons, which are connected to our crankshaft by way of connecting rods, will turn our crankshaft. And that twisting force, which results from the twisting of the crankshaft, is our engine torque. Now, in order to get that torque from our engine to our wheels, what comes next is a manual transmission. Now, in order to connect the crankshaft of your engine to the input shaft of your transmission, there's a clutch assembly that's used. And your clutch setup consists of a clutch disc, a pressure plate, and a manual transmission flywheel with a friction surface. Now, we're not gonna get into how a clutch system works in this video, I have a separate video for that, and I'll put a link to that at the end of this video if you're interested. But in so many words, your clutch system is there to allow you to engage and disengage your engine from your transmission. In other words, allow you to transfer torque from your engine into your transmission, and the job of your manual transmission or gearbox is to take in the torque that's coming from your engine through its input shaft, and change it to whatever you deem necessary for your driving conditions and send it out the output shaft of your transmission. And again, your transmission does this by the way of changing different gears, or in other words, gear ratios. So with that said, we'll start at our input shaft into our transmission housing. So as you can see, inside our transmission housing, our input shaft is connected to our input shaft gear. Actually, let's call this our driver gear as it's connected directly to the input shaft and it runs at the same RPM as our input shaft. All right, so from there, power travels through our driver gear down to this gear, which is connected or attached to our counter shaft. All right, so let's say we're gonna put our transmission into first gear and get going from a dead stop. So we would step on the clutch pedal, disengaging our crankshaft from our input shaft, which slows it down, but furthermore removes the torque from our engine from our input shaft. And then from there, with the help of our synchronizers that are on this, uh, output shaft here, uh, we can put the, line up the gears from this first gear that you see here with the hub or that's connected to this output shaft. And when we line that up and then remove our foot from the clutch, we again engage our crankshaft with our input shaft and transfer torque all the way from here down to this gear and up to first gear and out the output shaft. Now you'll probably notice that this first gear is a lot bigger than our driver shaft and our second gear. Now that's because when you're trying to get going from a dead stop, that's when you need the most amount of torque. So if you line up this smaller gear or driver gear to this larger gear, or let's call this the driven gear, you can produce a lot more torque by turning this to our output shaft. Now the trade-off is that it takes more revolutions for this smaller gear to turn this first gear one revolution. So here's an example that will help you understand. Let's say we want to take off this axle nut. Now we could use this wrench and let's say this wrench is only a foot long. Now let's assume I haven't had breakfast for today and the maximum amount of uh, torque or pressure I can apply at the end of this wrench is 30 pounds. Now I'm more than likely I'm not going to be able to twist off that axle nut so therefore what I can do is go grab a much longer wrench or a longer pipe and put it over this wrench and then apply the same amount of pressure or the 30 pounds at the end of that longer pipe or wrench. Therefore creating more torque and twisting that axle nut off. Now from that example, we can simply replace me or rather the force that I'm applying at the end of that wrench with the driver gear and then you can replace the different size gears inside your transmission with the different size wrenches that you could use to twist off that axle nut. However, due to the different sizes between the driver gear and the other driven gears, or in this case, let's say our first gear, it takes more revolutions for this driver gear to turn this first gear just one revolution. And as you probably guessed, that difference is your gear ratios. So for example, on this uh, first gear, it would take our driver gear or rather our input shaft gear 3.307 revolutions to turn this first gear one revolution. Or for the sake of our second gear, it would be 1.809 revolutions of this driver gear to turn this one revolution. For the third gear it would be 1.23. And for the fourth gear would be 0.85. And generally speaking, your last gear or the gears that require less than one revolution of the driver gear to turn one revolution are considered your overdrive gears. All right, not so fast. We're still not done with our gearing. So what I explained above was still up to this point. So we had our input shaft 
coming into our manual transmission. We had the gears inside here, and then here's our output shaft. But on a, let's say a real wheel drive, from here you're connected to your drive shaft, and from there you're connected to your rear differential. And on a real wheel drive vehicle with a differential in the rear, you have your uh, pinion gear and your ring gear, and those have a gear ratio of their own. Now, I don't know, let's just throw out a number. Let's say uh, 4.06. And what that means is that for every 4.06 revolutions of this drive shaft into this differential, the output shafts of the differential, or let's say the real axles from your rear differential will turn one revolution. All right, so as you can see, there's a lot of gearing involved between your uh, crankshaft or rather your engine and your wheels, and that's because this is the most efficient way to make the most efficient use out of the power that's coming from your engine. If you only use larger gears, you know, you're gonna have a really high RPM if you wanna drive at, you know, highway speeds, and uh, that's obviously if your engine allows for those high, really high RPMs, which will create a lot of noise and also, uh, you know, use up a lot of gas. But if you have an ability to change gear ratios, you know, you can use those really larger gears for when you need a lot of torque, like from going from a dead stop, and then once you get going and get to those highway speed or cruising speeds, you can, you know, use a much uh, smaller gear. Just think of a bicycle with gears, and if you're old enough, and remember, think of a bicycle without gears. Enough said. Now, as you probably guessed, if you want to get more torque, what you can do is to replace your gears inside the transmission or your final drive gear. Now, generally speaking, if you have a front wheel drive or an all wheel drive, you're gonna have a really hard time either digging into that transmission and replacing just the gears or your final drive gears uh, because you know it's just not worth opening those transmissions up, you know, locating or sourcing one of these gears, putting it back together, putting it back in the car. It's just gonna cost a lot of money and too much work and it's not gonna be worth the outcome unless you have a high performance vehicle again and uh, you know, that's a story on its own. However, if you have a real wheel drive vehicle, what you can do is to replace your final gears, which are going to be in your differential in the back. So you get those, you know, you get a bigger gears, you get this number higher, and uh, what that results is you get more torque at your wheels, but what you wanna pay attention to is that you're doing this on a car that is capable of revving higher than you know your average vehicle out there because you know if your car is not you know your red line is kind of low you can't really rev it that high what's going to happen is you're going to get more torque but then you want to you're trying to go cruising on the freeway trying to go 80 miles an hour or something then you're revving at you know 35 4000 rpms or something ridiculous like that it's just not going to be pleasant all right hope you enjoyed this video until next time you can check my other videos of which i put links to on this side of the screen and again links down below in the description box as well all right, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys soon.